one and I stand on that You and me, babe, that's black on black We are really talking about reclamation of our stories, reclaiming our narratives. And, um, you know, as as I'm always in awe of having this woman on the show, I get to talk with her. Um, I'm also reminded she is one of my favorites of all time. Uh, her ability to be able to weave tales, uh, true stories and and bring them to life in a way that just sparks your imagination beyond Belief. She, of, of course, is an American Book Award, NAACP Image Award winner. Uh, her latest book is called The Reformatory. Let me welcome the great Tanana Reeve. Do hello. Yes. So good to be here. Miss you. you. I miss you too. Um, I just told someone I was talking with an agent yesterday and we were dis- discussing books and stuff. And I was like, who's your favorite author? And she was like, I it's like picking a favorite child. She said, who's yours? I was like, Tanana Reeve Do is in there. Um, I've read, I think everything, um, Joplin's ghost, the good house, um, the black rose, because those two Joplin's ghost and black rose, two historic figures that you fictionalized. Uh, but it's the living blood in my soul to keep is where I was like, yeah, who is this, who, how did this woman capture vampire uh, vampires from Africa and make <laughs> like, what is going on in her mind? Like, I need to know. Uh, so thank you. And this latest book we're going to get into, but for you, um, telling the stories of real people and then finding a way for us to care about them. What's the entry point for you? How do, how do you get there? Oh, that's, that's such a great question. You know, you brought up the black rose, like how do you bring Madam CJ Walker to life? I just had to start literally at the beginning. (laughs) Like when she was a child, uh, right after slavery, and it's the same with the reformatory really is through these these people who lived it because i have so much respect for my ancestors my late mother patricia stevens do patricia gloria stevens do i named a character after her in the reformatory was um she's in the florida civil rights hall of fame my dad is in the florida civil rights hall of fame and we're losing this generation my dad is 89 years old I talked to a survivor of the Dozier School, which I fictionalized in the reformatory, who's 88 years old. And I really do want to sort of show how the world looked through their eyes. Do you, um, I call, like, I'm not a fiction writer, but I don't even hardly dream. So for me, like my imagination, yeah, I'm not, I'm not somebody, I, I don't, I don't live in fancy. I'm like very literal and, you know, I'm, I'm in this hard place of life. Like I'm in this life, not the people who aren't, aren't, you know, I'm just saying we all built kind of differently, but I love novels, you know, so yes. I can go there, but it's just not my, it's not my natural as a writer. But when I write other people's stories, cause I do memoirs. I channel them like I, I'm, I embody them. I put on their their clothes and I walk in their steps and then I, I have to breathe their words out on the paper. Do Is that is that your process? That's what you have to do. You know, it's difficult, especially with a public figure like someone like Madam G. C.J. Walker, because people are messy. Right. So you can't <laughs> create yeah. characters who are sort of I mean, not not to say bad things about biopics, but sometimes biopics have that kind of dry by the numbers energy, right? And I'm trying to find a way to bring them to life. That means their flaws. That means their heartaches. That means their joy. So yes, I'm trying to channel these people for sure. Okay. Uh, was this more difficult? We're talking with Tanana Reeve The Reformatory is her latest book. And it's inspired, of course, uh, by a true story of a reformatory, the Dozier School for Boys in Mariana, Florida. You have a personal connection to that. Uh, Your great uncle, uh, Robert Stevens, died in this reformatory. Was it more difficult? Because Madam C.J. Walker, I don't imagine you knew her. Uh, Scott Joplin, I don't don't know how you got his ghost, but I don't think you knew him either. No. Um, But this is somebody in your family who you used to tell a larger story. Was it more difficult? It was. I used to think that the most difficult book to write was the civil rights memoir with my late mother, Freedom and the Family. Yes. (laughs) But no, honey, this one topped it. This is about children. And it was soon after my mother died that we heard from the Florida um, State Attorney's Office that she had a relative who might have died at the Dozier School. They, They were going to do exhumations. So they called and my dad and I went to the grounds 
And from day one, I'm at a meeting, meeting survivors, black and white, hearing from the researcher, Dr. Aaron Kimberly from the University of South Florida, how many bodies might be in unmarked graves, just buried in the woods like dogs, children. And, and for that reason, I knew I had to write about it. I didn't think it was my place to do it as a memoir. I still don't know much about the life of the true life, Robert Stevens. I know he died in 1937. I know he was 15 when he died. I decided to set this book in 1950 to make it more accessible to me, my mother's childhood era. I knew that era better, made him 12 so that everyone would see him as a child. You know, sometimes our mm -hmm. teenagers don't, often <laughs> our Black teenagers do not get looked upon as children. So I wanted to have no doubt. No, no, this is a child. This is a story happening to a child. And let me tell you, shoot, that call was 10 years ago. And I, I spent at least seven years working on the novel, or should I say sometimes not working on the novel, because the research, holy cow, reading the memoirs, talking to survivors or their families, just imagining my own son. What if he were in that situation? It is definitely the most difficult book I've ever written. Mm. As you're talking about unmarked graves, I was talking about um, Zora Neale Hurston, unmarked grave. You know, you think about all of our ancestors I was sharing with, with the audience, you know, we're going to be doing a retreat in Charleston, uh, Kiowa, South Carolina. And uh, on my site visit, I got out to look at, uh, to see this angel oak tree that was four or 500 years old. And as I'm standing on the land, all I can imagine were all of the enslaved people who were on this land, who just were tossed away after their bodies gave up air, no grave, no marker, just tossed away. So no, someone else can come in and pick that cotton not valued that's, that's thousands maybe millions of those bodies those bones in unmarked mm. just in the dirt in the soil right and we don't know them right so i i just want to say thank you for even erecting the names even if you you've added fictional elements because to tell these stories is to put the pieces together for us to then be able to build in the future as well. So thank you for doing this. And this is so important, even if it was yeah. difficult, took so many years. Thank you. I appreciate that. I felt like I had to do it though. I feel like, well, first of all, I had just lost my mother and we had a very close relationship. So I think my father and I both um, felt like researching this book, these road trips we were taking to Mariana to look at the remains of the school and, and the meetings. We really felt like we were honoring her memory and this relative, I don't think she ever knew about this hole in her family history. Like you're talking about, we so many of us have these holes. It's a shock if we even see photographs of Black people from the 1870s or 1880s or turn of the century or 1920s. I mean, the list can go on and on. We, we were erased from a lot of cinematic history during those eras. And then the trauma is so great in many of our family, many of our families, that there are those stories people won't tell. And Robert Stevens was one of those stories people would not tell. And even though it's not exactly his life and exactly his history, I even in the short time since it's been published, I've heard from survivors that they feel seen by this story. That it eerily, like one man who was there in the 90s, this really struck me on book tour. This was a white man because it was segregated. I know the Black children caught more hell, but the white children were, were also getting beaten and whipped. And he was shaking beside me. And he said the book made him feel seen. Now, mind you, this is a book set in Jim Crow, Florida in 1950. So how could someone who is a child in the 90s feel seen by that book? That horrible institution was still traumatizing children long, wow. long, long past its, its opening in 1900. For a hundred so, so years, it was terrorizing children. Tanana Rivdu, author of many, 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 many books, and she get her whole collection, her whole library of books that she has written. Um, tell us about this Dozier School. What Dozier School for Boys, Mariana, Florida. It, it was originally it, one of the names for it was the Florida Industrial School for Boys. That's how a survivor I talked to last week remembered it, and the superintendent there was named Dozier, and it was basically like a 
think of a juvenile hall from contemporary times because it was a prison. Like if you were a truant in school, sometimes you were just an orphan, maybe breaking and entering, you name it, they would send you to this facility, except don't picture it like our juvenile facilities today. It was spread out across several acres. It's a campus. It had a white side and a black side. And those children picked corn. They did chores. The man told me last week I was a slave at that place. So it was a work farm. Almost want to call it concentration camp. The things that the children were subjected to, those whippings and what was called the White House. I think that was the experience most young people came out of that with, the ones who left. But unfortunately, uh, up to nearly 100 of them did not come home over that time. Uh, there was a fire in real life that you could call negligence, but I, I chose to call it something else in my novel. I fictionalized that. The, uh, you know, people would try to run away. The children would try to run. And they would frankly lie to the families about the circumstances of their, their deaths. Sometimes maybe they didn't know. I, I, I don't know all what happened there, but it seems to me that children were sexually assaulted, uh, content warning, and, and which I did not want to really deal with in my book, <laughs> and also it, at times killed while they were trying to run, especially, or sometimes during their beatings. Hmm. 866 Um. The most shocking revelation, I, I guess maybe it was the rape, you know, you, I, I don't think we think enough about rape of boys. You know, we, we, we talk often about, of course, the sexual exploits of, of, you know, what, what people who own people did to girls, because we see the manifestation of that in, in the children, the many, the lightning and the, the octoroons and the mulattoes and all, you know, that, that graced, uh, you know, the United States, we, we can see the manifestation of the rape and sexual assault. Uh, but in the boys, just the trauma that carries generation to generation that never gets talked about because it's, it's not, it's not proper to talk about it. Right. We don't talk about these things. It's it's even really, frankly, considered a, a joke. You hear people joking, don't don't uh, you know, pick up the soap, don't bend over in the shower. So so men will joke about this, but there's a lot of sexual assault that happens in adult prison. And one of the most heartbreaking things I learned while researching this book, because there is a mirror between 1950 and today in terms of criminal justice, especially so-called juvenile justice. I mean, honestly, children are more criminalized now than they were in 1950. That's just statistically, the whole system is bigger than it was in 1950. But I learned in the book, Burning Down the House and Into Juvenile Prison, that most young people who are sexually assaulted at juvenile facilities, well, guess who they're assaulted by? It's not the other prisoners. It's by the guards. And that is always true. There's a famous movie wow. literally about some boys, men who go back, you know, to get revenge uh, against people who uh, molested them in these facilities. So it's very common but my protagonist, Robert, is only 12. And part of the reason I wanted him to be only 12 was because it's his sense of innocence that both helps him see the ghosts because he hasn't reached that age of rationality, that age where we let go of imagination and forget that we used to draw and act and dream, right? So he's right at that point. And I wanted it to write it in such a way that it's not the periphery, like the reader gets what's happening and sometimes we get into the super the, the psychopathic superintendent's point of view he totally gets what's happening but i wanted to hold robert in some innocence about that like for half a second i said do i want him to be assaulted i was like no no it was hard enough for me to send my <laughs> beloved character into this place right. much less could i have done that to him the Reformatory is the latest uh, in a string of amazing books by Tanana Rivdu. Um You love dabbling in the supernatural. Uh, I don't think every book in fiction. has a ghost. In fiction, in fiction. let's clarify. Fiction. Okay, so in your real life, do you believe in ghosts? In your real life, do you do you see? Do you get visitations in your real life? Are are they are they present? Do you do 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 the do they talk to you? You know, I, I I would like to say I wish, I really wish I had a clearer pipeline, you know, and when you say, do I believe, I believe other people's stories, other people's stories have directly led me to Joplin's ghost, you know, uh, curator at the Scott Joplin house who, who told me how he had seen a ghost and what the ghost looked like. And it looked just like a regular man, which is something I've carried with me 
into the reformatory. If he saw a ghost and he says a ghost can look just like a regular person standing there, that's how I'm going to make my ghost look too. Some of them anyway. So, you know, I had a dream after my grandmother died where I felt like a visit and a, and a similar dream when a friend died that felt like a visit. But how can I know the difference between that and an actual visit? But you write about this a lot, though. That and vampires and stuff. Like, it. You, I mean, you know, I, I actually believe in the supernatural. I believe that that the the that there are dimensions of existence, right? And that life is not linear but circular. And that you know, and this is why it's so important <laughs> that we we lean into goodness here. Period, because yes. you you know, because it, it 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 reverberates throughout, right? You what you know, uh, Doctor Black said, "What you sow, the heaven that you make here is what is being stored for you in heaven, heaven there, right?" So you you there's an exchange for you as a writer, um, very very cerebral. How, why is it so easy for you to delve into this if you yourself do not experience these things on a regular uh-huh. basis? Maybe that is why. I had someone tell me once I wouldn't write about it <laughs> if I had experienced ah. it, you know? So for me, it is the theoretical. And I scare myself when I'm writing all the time, but it's not because I really feel like I'm going to hear those footsteps outside of my closed door. Although sometimes I honestly wish I would, you know, just the one really? time, at least Ooh. one time, if I could just have something so definitive. But, you know, I get little things, little whispers, like after my mother passed, I had incredible opportunities. I couldn't even dream about it. Spelman College, never taught full time in my life. And and there I was having an unbelievable experience. And I do feel that connection to my late mother and my grandmother, and I am wanting to express them through my story is literally a way to try to help my mother have a ghost that other people can see. Because Gloria, the protagonist in the reformatory, is very much based on my mother. And I will say this, it's only because of the ghost that I could write this book. For me, a horror novel is a more gentle journey than the actual history of this place. Oh, it, it really is. It's like, oh, you all think it's and I'm not saying it's easy. There are hard moments in this novel, but I'm really gratified that people also notice that there's a lot of hope in this novel. And unfortunately, when you're talking about what really happened for a lot of those children, there was not a lot of hope. There mm. was no happy ending. They're still traumatized generations later. You say you scare yourself. We're talking with Tanana Reeve author of many books. Um, my favorite series is Living Blood, My Soul to Keep. That that tr- is a trilogy uh, where you follow an ancient, an ancient one through through the times. And I think it is it a so, quadrilogy. Uh, qu- wait, it's it four. Is it what, what do you call it? Qua- it's quadrilo- quadrilogy. <laughs> We don't know what Let's to call it. But quadrilogy. It's my... Let's do that. Quadrilogy. I think it's a quadrilogy. Quadrilogy. Yeah. My bad. My bad. Um, I don't know if I did the last one. What uh, was the name of the last one? My soul to take was the last. See, full circle. My soul to take. Soul okay. To, keep to my soul to take. Okay. And then in between, it's the living blood and blood colony. Blood colony. Was that the one where the baby was... Anyway, let me not say, let me not say, 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 in the back. Okay. All right. Cause it all, it's like a blur. Cause when you read, read these things, it's like, uh, you're following these people and they become part of your family. Scary. I don't read your books at night, by the way. Oh, I don't play around. I don't play around. I'm not playing around at night. I just, I'm not playing around. Do you write at night? Cause you say you scare yourself. Like, is there, is there a point where you're like, "Mm -mm, let me not awaken. I was watching goosebumps. Right. And they got this little chant that they do. I got to mute that. Yeah, really? I gotta, yes, yes, yes. yes, yes I hope you know. Don't, don't I judge don't mean, me. It's for don't judge children. Me. <laughs> yeah, don't judge me. Don't judge me. But they're 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 doing this chant. I don't listen to chants. I'm not listening to it. I'm not even w- bringing that into my spirit. I'm going la 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 and hit the mute button. You're writing this stuff though. Are you are you inviting it in? Or are you are you nervous about you know, that? I do have some superstitions. You know, I don't often write at night to answer your question. Uh, often it's because I'm shutting down by evening. So it's usually morning or afternoon because it's more like just a regular job. But I do have superstitions about doing certain things to characters because for a while it seemed like the things that I wrote about were starting to manifest in my life. Like when I wrote The Good House, my character, Angela, 
was from Los Angeles. And I described places in Los Angeles. And guess what? I moved to Los Angeles. <laughs> you know, little stuff like that. Like I'm almost projecting a future in my stories. So that makes me superstitious. There's a decision I made, a very difficult decision I made way back in my soul to keep before I had children. I don't think I could make that same decision today now that I have a son. Mm. So I'm mm. more superstitious. The, the fright part is that whatever the, the thing is, like the nugget that's burning that I feel like I have to express in a story. In this case, it was this poor child and, and others like him who died at this reformatory and letting their ghost speak. Or it might be a weird fungus that grew in my shower. And I'm like, where the hell did that come from? And why am I just noticing that today? How did it get so big? Like, it's like, what? Like you take, so these <laughs> moments of big fears, little fears, whatever they are. And I try to mold it into a funhouse mirror, like some sort of, what's a weird way to look at this? Like from another angle that in the case of Robert Stevens and real life terror against children, that's the part I'm trying to hide from. I have to give it homage. I have, it would be dishonest to write about this place. And it did not feel like a brutal, terrible place. That That's just mm -hmm. the bottom line. But the gentle part, the imagination part, the fantasy part is where you get, and I think I got this from my late mother. I don't know if we talked about this, but she was the one who loved horror. So civil rights activists love horror that used to confuse me until I started to see the relationship between horror and trauma, right? Mm. And for some of us, not everybody, if you're going through something or if you've been through something, there is something comforting about fantasy monsters that actually seems to lift some of that weight off your chest, right? Like there's a movie called The Dark and the Wicked. It's real dark and real wicked now. It's not for everybody. This is like along the lines of hereditary. It's, it's mm. hardcore, but it's about caretaking and siblings who are caring for a dying father. And the supernatural element is so scary. Ooh, it's, it's just, it's a demon. I'll say that. It's a demon. You are in trouble if it's a demon. <laughs> okay. But the fact that they have the demon on top of the caretaking makes it feel like what I'm going through, you know what? Maybe it's not yeah. as bad. It ain't a I'm, demon. It is at not, least it's not a demon. At least. Oh, <laughs> oh, my goodness. I mean, you're saying something though. I mean, I cut my teeth on Stephen King before I met you, right? Stephen King. Uh, and Rice, you know, I read he blurred all, this all, book on Twitter. He said he couldn't. I saw put that. It down. I was so excited. Uh, but, but I, you know, reading his memoir as well, it's you start to see, you know, that this is the escape. You know, horror it becomes the escape, which is crazy yeah. when you think about uh, the, how horror, horror, horrible horror can be. I mean, Flowers in the Attic was like scary for me when I was you know, little. I was like, what is happening? And that wasn't demons, or was it? Uh, Tanana Reeve Dew is here. Um, let's spend a little time with the person that introduced you to horror. Besides, uh, of course, Octavia Butler, uh, Freedom in the Family, the mother-daughter memoir of the fight for civil rights, a uh, book that you wrote with your mom who made transition uh, 12, 13 years ago. Um, mm. Tell me tell me about Patricia Stevens Dew and not just her impact on you, but she actually is more famous or should be more famous than you are in terms of the work the work right maybe I, she, you know, she had I, her I, even do that. I mean she's in the Florida Civil Rights Hall of Fame posthumously along with my father who is still living but you know I grew up uh, knowing exactly who my parents were e even if everybody didn't there were enough people who did so if she was upset about something and she left a message for the governor's office his office called back an hour later See that? I was like, oh, shoot. So, so, That's my mom. Let, 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 I mean, but there yeah, was a bad yeah. side to that. <laughs> wait, wait, just pause for that for a second, because your mother, it's not that she was quote unquote famous. I'm saying that she did, you know, as a little girl, she was fighting injustice. Oh, so, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. So so that her spirit, like she picked up the phone to call the governor's office and they better call back. And that's hour. true. And she always had that. And that was something I knew from reading the book. And since she had passed away. And so I couldn't talk to her about Robert Stevens. I basically just decided, like you said, to try to channel my mother through the co-protagonist of Gloria, who is Robert's sister. So he's battling the, you know, the living and the dead inside while she's battling the monster that is the Jim Crow system and the existing system we still have from the outside. And at every step, 
uh, here she is. Her dad's gone. Her brother's been taken away. Her closest ally is an old woman in her 80s. <laughs> you know, what can you do against the system? And every time I came up against that, you know, it was like, what would mom have done? Because she was doing it in high school. She went when Brown versus the Board of Education came down for the Supreme Court and she realized they were about to, or she thought they were about to have integrated schools. She started a petition to get rid of her principal, who was a black principal, by the way, because she thought he was subpar. They needed a better principal so they could be ready for integration. Now, we all know good and damn well she did not see any damn integration <laughs> while she was in high school. We all know how that went. Uh, but but that was her spirit. She didn't care who it was. The postman said something he shouldn't say. She went right home to her mom and reported it. And they both went to the post office to complain. And let me tell you, a lot of black people in the South would have been very nervous about doing these kinds of things in the 1950s, which mm -hmm. is when she was doing these things. But they just and I'll have to credit my grandmother too, Lottie Sears Houston. Let me say her name. That's how you bring a ghost, by the way, if you're trying to conjure a ghost. I decided in the reformatory, the surest way to bring them as close to a spot as you can is to say their full name because they have not heard their names in so long. It's irresistible. Um, it's also an African way to keep people alive, which is in alignment with what you're saying right now, right? Because what mm -hmm. is life? What is life? We It's breath, right? Yes. We breathe life by speaking their name, say their breath. names, it's, say their yes, names. Yes. It's so important. You're, you're so incredibly powerful. Uh, and you, you married, uh, a writer, y'all produce stuff together as well. Uh, you and Stephen well, Barnes and, uh, you know, produce movies and things. The best thing I think, uh, that you've done maybe is your son. I'm not sure. I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah. We have a 19 year old. With that. Yes. 19, 19 year old son. He's still living 19. With us yeah, so we love it. We love parenting at this phase. I mean, every phase is is magical, if challenging, of course. I, you know, parents out there like, well, uh, everything ain't magical. No, <laughs> but, um, but this phase, the mature phase, and like the work starts showing more. It's just he's. I have him watching lectures from the class I teach at UCLA. And, you know, that's a whole different relationship. And I, it's such a blessing. But Steve and I also, you know, we were in a writer's room, but right before the writer's strike for Crystal Lake, which, knock on wood, mm. is um, a Friday the 13th prequel series that, that Brian Fuller invited us to take part in. And we have a podcast called Life Writing Right for Your Life. I have to mention that because that has been fun. That's a way we we tell people about our 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 philosophies about writing and we bring in guests to talk about how you keep balanced, you know, like, cause that's the struggle. Like now I haven't had a book tour in a long time. Now, you know, it's been a minute since I had a big book out. Right. So the travel piece, the hotels, I'm after COVID, like you're saying, uh, I'm having to learn how to travel too. I'm not peeing in the middle of the aisle, but <laughs> you have to get used to being around people and not being in your space. And I'm, I'm a settled homebody kind of person it's very tough for me so I'll talk about that on the podcast like how am I coping with even even a blessing brings challenges too I say that is the truth uh well come on back any any time I wish this to be the biggest bestseller the reformatory uh y'all get this book make it a holiday read uh you know may scare yourself but you know life can be scarier Tanana Rivdu is going to give you your life in these books. Uh, the Reformatory, the latest. Thank you for coming through today. I appreciate it. Thank you. you for having me. And just trust me, y'all. I know the book sounds hard, but trust me. Oh, I trust you. I trust yes. you. I'm actually, I'm, I got to catch up too. My soul to take and I got to catch up <laughs> and I got to get the Reformatory. Uh, I'm buying it so I can have it in my library. When I see you, you got to sign it for me. Uh, Tanana oh, Rivdu, you, you can follow her. Thank you. Follow her at Tanana Reeve, T-A-N-A-N-A-R-I-V-E do d-u-e dot com and at tanana reeve do because nobody else has that name you better say it all right sure <laughs> it's don't. the carrot at the show they sure we'll don't. be right back thank you i hope thank i wasn't you. talking too much but i do get excited uh, no. no good no this is this, okay we talk this is a talk show so we good to see to you talk. yeah it's good to see you too how are I you i wish doing? i were in the studio though this sucks doing it out it, it does it does but you know it doesn't suck for me to have to brave traffic i'm i feel like it's okay it's okay oh, this, you're this at is home. the one yeah this is the one yeah oh, 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, if you're at the home, one. then I'm glad we're both at home. That's how it should yeah. be. Yeah. I've been able to talk to people that, you know, in Africa and London, you know, um, this, this, this pandemic has opened up my, my show to more people. So I'm, I'm grateful uh, that I'm not grateful for the pandemic, but I'm grateful that we figured out different ways to communicate with folk and, and, and different ways to uh, make uh, uh, income because did you start a clothing line when I, I mean, what you have a clothing yeah. line. What, what is yeah, that I, about? I don't oh, know anything so, about it. Yeah, so I started as a, like this is it. We, I started as a marketing, uh, you know, marketing for the show. Like I had this yes. concept, we're not minorities. I interviewed Frances Cress Welsing, and she said, "We're not minorities. We're the global majority." And I was like, "I'm gonna put that on a T-shirt." So I started doing T-shirts when I first started the show. But then I realized quickly, I'm not. I can't be packing and picking and packing and sending people stuff, and they tell me this no, wrong size. No, this ain't my no. mission. This is not. Mm-hmm. So I got with this guy who's actually in the clothing business, and I said, "Here's here's my concept." So you know, I want to put people, uh, honor people. We're doing something with Jen Thorpe. I'm getting a license for that. Like I want to want to immortalize folk in our community, but also bring these statements. Like this latest drop is. Freedom isn't free because we're heading into this 2024. Everybody's talking about liberties and rights, but you got to get your ass out there and vote and do something. This is not just freedom and just come. It's not raining oh, down. Oh, like, no, what? it's you a know. battle. Every My mom knew. Her, she used to sign her books, The Struggle Continues, because she was just waiting for that clock to turn back. She knew. Yes. She knew that this clock was going to turn back. She oh, absolutely. Knew that, Trump would not you know, have that... surprised her one. She halfway expected her phones were still tapped. She never trusted that everything was 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 changed. You know, <laughs> and you, there's something insidious about a system that will lull you into a false sense of security. But you and I, I think we're similar ages. We, I think we had a good moment. You know, the '80s really had a lot of bad. Obviously, Reagan and all kinds of crack. St- yeah, right, right. All kinds of bullshit happened, but at least for about five minutes there, it seemed like corporate America was scrambling to bring more black folks into their companies, recruiting hard, you know, good financial aid packages, just but you know, the toys we have the black yes. dolls. It yes, really yes, I mean yes. I think we can be forgiven for yeah. believing that we were doing a like a like a takeoff mm-hmm. and then <laughs> obama if- got elected then obama got we're like uh, oh okay you know ebony jet i'm I'm just saying you know it felt anyway. like yeah we're yes. headed there but yes. whoops, there's some bumpy air ahead yes. my dear this is an yes. interesting interesting time and i and i can't i agree with you about the voting it is absolutely essential, but I can also understand why a lot of disaffected young people are like, I'm not voting for this. Yeah. And it doesn't make yeah. sense to our generation, but it makes but we know. perfect sense to their generation because that's yeah. how my mom was. Her, yeah. her, her, her stepfather had made his accommodations with the system and had a job as a principal. And he's like, what are y'all doing? Why are you in jail? We just saved to send you to college. They're like, no, yeah. this will not abide. This system they, they will not abide. And that's... That's what young people do. I know. We got to go. I love you. Thank you. 